June 3rd, 2017. I'd like to share some thoughts on investing in complex technological environments. My starting point is going to be complex adaptive systems and the different vantage points one can have when thinking about these systems. So it's possible to think about the system from the inside out. So imagine there's a system, our vantage points is somewhere inside here, and from here, there appears to be a lot of change, a lot of activity going on all around us, and as we try and characterize that activity, it seems from that vantage point that it's random, it's unordered, it's unpredictable, there's a distributed sense of control, and there's a lot of emergence happening. So this is when we view things from the inside out, Alternatively, if we view that system from the outside in, so our vantage point is, say, over here, then we may see that over time, there's similar patterns of emergence, and in space, there appears to be similar characteristics that define that system. So this is the vantage point or the approach to systems that I'm going to take, and beginning to mathematize that, if we consider time and space, then what we're saying is that there's an implicit order in time, meaning that we see a similar pattern emerge regardless of the kind of technology we're looking at, or the kind of environment we're looking at, or the area in which this environment exists. And we can characterize some stages of this pattern as being physical, vital, mental, meaning that the physical is where everything appears to maintain its stability, the vital is where some experimentation begins, and the mental is where things are driven by curiosity. And this emergent pattern tells us that basically for the system to experience greater degrees of freedom, it goes through a certain order in time that's characterized by these same stages of development regardless of the area that we're looking at. And when we step back and ask why the similar pattern occurs in time, regardless of the system we're looking at, we're led to the possibility that there is an implicit structure in space. And we can characterize this structure by essentially saying, you know, why does this pattern exist no matter what system we're looking at? And that gives us a sense of a quality of, of presence in space that allows a similar pattern to emerge no matter what. It gives us a sense for the quality of power in space because no matter what kind of opposition exists, we always move on to the next level in the pattern. It gives us a sense of knowledge in this space because the same pattern always occurs by utilizing the right circumstances and the right instruments. So there's an implicit knowledge and then there's an implicit harmony in this space because there's a sense of co-evolution where all the participants or stakeholders or pieces of the system are moving together in, in unison, if you will, towards some kind of undisclosed future or event. Now, in such an environment, what we, when we abstract out and say, we can begin to mathematize the innovation that exists in this environment that's structured by an ordered time and an ordered space. And in such an environment, one thing that we can say is that innovation is always accessible. So let's call this property of innovation being always accessible as system X, meaning that any dimension of space we look at, and that's characterized by the big X, there is this ubiquitous innovation that is bound by these four characteristics, it becomes, or we become aware of this ubiquitous innovation that exists in any system through certain sets along these X dimensions, and these are infinite sets. And further, what that allows us to do is to create unique seeds of innovation or organization that we can represent by sig to the small x, x essentially being strapped to the dimension of time, 
because there's a discovery involved here. And again, summarizing this signature X is essentially created through an infinite number of combinations that are possible in these four infinite sets. However, so while this is kind of the implicit innovation that might exist in any system, and so there's some kind of a, a precipitation that's here, the reality of <clears throat> where we exist is some kind of untransformed sets along each of these dimensions here, and we only have access to these higher levels of innovation if we are able to break certain patterns. So these patterns are represented by P uh, to the subscript X. And similarly, we only have access to these higher levels if, again, we are able to break certain patterns. I'm not going to go into the details of these patterns, but essentially what this equation is, the equation that's beginning to emerge is telling us that at the untransformed layer, these are the di dynamics of innovation that exist. And then if we break through certain patterns, we have access to meta layers of innovation, which are characterized by M2 and M3. And basically, if we think about innovation as being some kind of a, a function of this core matrix, then there is essentially a movement towards transform sets of innovation from the untransformed sets, meaning our sources of innovation become much richer. And this itself is an iterative quality where as time proceeds, the next base untransformed set is the previous transformed set. So what we're essentially saying is that when we think about a complex technological environment, it's possible to frame it as being existing within a, a ordered time and an ordered space. And therefore, it's possible to arrive at some kind of an equation for a systematic equation that defines how innovation happens in that environment. Now, this sets a context for investing in that environment because the fact that you have multiple sources of innovation means that you ideally want to invest in that technology or that play that has a deeper source of innovation attached to it. So we can abstract this out, this kind of core matrix. And if I abstract these four layers, the essential practical problem becomes one of figuring out which source of innovation is it XU, SIG X, SET X, Big X, System X, that may be driving a particular orientation in that environment. And the orientations you may have, uh, we're saying uh, four essential orientations here. And we can, around this practical problem, erect a, a function, I'll call this dynamic interaction, which basically has uh, two components. There's a vertical component and there's a horizontal component. So here we have DIV applied to this. And what we're saying is that when we apply this vertical dynamic interaction function to this core matrix, it outputs for us the actual level of in innovation that exists within that system. And I'll call that the X state, which can be defined as an element of basically the set of X, U, SIG X, set X, system X, where by definition, the power of system X is greater than the power of set X, is greater than the power of signature small X, greater than the power of X, U. Now, the second part of this dynamic interaction function is essentially 
to consider the similar matrix along each of the four characteristic dimensions of space and we can simplify those as meaning physical, vital, mental, integral and so there's a correlation between the physical and presence between the vital and power between the mental and knowledge between the integral and harmony and the, the next practical question is how do we know actually which level might be operative in this vertical dimension here and one way to arrive at that is to consider a calculus of sorts so if we we want to figure out over time what really is the source of innovation so I'll just capture that by being dn where n is the source of innovation over t and this may resolve itself into let's simplify into eight different um, parameters if you will four along the untransformed dimension and four along the transformed dimension so we may have the physical you vital untransformed mental untransformed integral untransformed or their counterparts of physical transformed vital transformed mental transformed integral transformed and if this resolves into this column here then essentially we're saying that um, the source of innovation is simply here and we're done however if it resolves into one of these uh, transformed uh, parameters here then essentially we're saying that the source of innovation can be either m1 m2 or m3 and we have to apply some further uh, integral calculus to figure out what this might be so if to figure out what the source of innovation might be essentially what we want to do is we want to take the integral of a small area around where this innovation appears to be happening and see if the rate of change of that transformation from the untransformed set to the transformed set over time is greater than a threshold of signature x. If this is the case, then we know that the source of innovation is m1. Similarly, if we take an integral for 0 to b, where b, if a is this area here, b might be a larger area within that system, and we apply a similar a rate of change from the untransformed to the transformed over time and if this value is greater than a threshold of the architectural force we know that the source of innovation is m2 or we may take an even larger area let's call that a and apply a double integral 0 a over 0 and zero time and the rate of change of the untransformed set and if it has the ability to sustain itself over a larger area and over a larger time frame and it is greater than the threshold of system property then we know that the source of innovation is M3 so up here so essentially once we know the source of innovation then the practical problem becomes one of seeing which of these matrices are active so let me just redraw this over here so if we have in any system PVMI, basically P could represent in a technological environment some kind of incremental technologies. V could re represent some new experimental technologies. M could represent some trend-based technologies. And I could represent some hybrid technologies. So if we're saying that by definition 
system X has the greatest influence. So we want to invest in a technology where the source of innovation is M3 or system X, because by definition, that's going to have the biggest impact. So we have X dollars. We want to be able to invest it in a technology that's going to sustain itself over time and space. And so it, ideally, what we're saying is that we want to get to, of these four kinds of layers here, all things being equal, we would like to invest in a technology at this top layer because we know it's going to have the most impact. But if we can also leverage off an existing technology that has that same impact, that's going to be the best deal, if you will. And so if we consider this matrix P, where we're talking about incremental technologies, so we've already done a lot of work, and then we figure out some nuance to this existing technology. So it's an incremental technology, and it has this huge impact in that it can systematically uh, influence all sex signatures and existing movements at the untransformed level, then this is going to provide us the biggest um, return on investment uh, right here. And by the same logic, we could say that if we have some kind of trend-based or hybrid technology in which there's a lot of work to be done, but they're going to have a small impact, meaning that they exist at the XU level, then it makes perhaps least sense to invest over here. And so what we end up with is through the application of basically this DI function, a way to determine what technologies from a whole bunch of at least 16 different sources of technologies that may exist within an environment where it would make most sense to focus and essentially create the largest return on investment.